as you could probably tell from the intro, Rails Cast has been completely redesigned. I'm really excited about this. The video itself is a new widescreen resolution, and the website itself has been redesigned as well, so I encourage you to check it out. But here's a quick tour. Uh, you can now subscribe to Rails Cast in various ways at the top here. Um, you can also browse the episodes in various ways on the site. And you can now play the video in line right on the page, and it works with HTML5 and Flash if you don't have HTML5. And you can now copy and paste the code very easily using a little clippy here in the corner. And the comments have a new style and look as well. So I encourage you to check it out at railscast.com uh, for the new design. But now let's get to the episode. As you may have heard, the Rails 3.1 beta was just released. So over the next several episodes, I'll be covering some of these great new features which are in Rails 3.1. And in this episode, I want to show you how you can get it set up on your system and I'll give you an overview of these various new features. Let's try it out. Now before you go installing the beta version of the Rails gem, I highly recommend you first use RVM to create a gem set so it's sort of isolated from the rest of your environment and you're able to test it without messing up your Rails 3.0 install. So we can do that by setting it to use 192 and then to make a gem set, uh, I like to call it Rails Pre and use double dash create to create that gem set. And then we can do gem install rails, double dash pre, to install the pre-release version of the uh, Rails gem inside this gem set. So there we go, you can see it installed the beta 1 version, and we can check out the version number here, and you can see Rails 3.1 beta 1. And then we can create a new application just like normal with the Rails new command, I'll call it to-do. And one of the changes to the defaults in Rails 3.1 is that it uses jQuery by default instead of prototype. Now you can customize this with the dash J option and we can pass in prototype here if you want, but I'm a jQuery fan, so I'll leave it at the default. Now before I open up the project, it's important that I should go in here and run the bundle command to install all the necessary gems uh, to get my app running. Now with those gems installed, let's check out what this application looks like. So here it is in TextMate, and by the way, I'm switching to a sidebar here, as you may notice, and that's available through the missing drawer plugin, which I'll link to in the show notes if you're interested in that. And first let's check out the gem file because that's a good place to start. Now the first few lines in here are pretty standard, but then we get into something called asset template engines, which is really neat because now Rails 3.1 comes with SAS and CoffeeScript enabled by default, uh, which I'm really looking forward to using more and exploring more in future episodes. And then we have uh, this gem called Uglifier, which is basically a way to compress the JavaScript code for production, so it'll basically minimize it. And then we have the jQuery Rails gem, uh, which if we specify the prototype option, it'll just use the prototype Rails gem. And then we also have this turn gem, which I'll show you a little later too. It basically makes the test output a little nicer. So really the biggest change here is how the assets are handled uh, by the template engines. And if we take a look at our public directory here, you'll notice that something is missing. We don't have our JavaScript and stylesheet directories here any longer. So where do we put our JavaScript and CSS code? Well, it's now under the app assets directory. So if you go under here, you can see we now have JavaScripts and style sheets. So this is where from now on, you'll be putting all of your JavaScript and CSS code in Rails 3.1 applications. So then if we take a peek inside this application JS file, you can see based on this little note at the top that this is intended to be a manifest file and isn't really where your JavaScript code goes. Instead, you'll be spreading your JavaScript out into other files in this directory. So let me generate some scaffolding so you get a real world picture on how this would work. So we can generate some scaffolding here. I'll just call it a project and give it a name string attribute. And you can see just by the output here, it generated some files under app assets. So we have some style sheets and a JavaScript file. And notice it ends in SCSS uh, and CoffeeScript. So um, using the new technique here with the generated files, and we'll take a look at those in detail. But first, let's just migrate uh, the database here. Let's take a look at some of the generated files here. We have our scaffold SCSS file here, and it looks pretty much like standard CSS, except, well, further down here, you can see we have some nesting. And this is a feature that I'm really looking forward to using in SAS. And I'll be covering SAS in more detail in a future episode. But here it's just neat to see it in action. 
And notice we also have a projects scss file here, which is blank, but it's a good place to put project-related code. Similarly, with a projects CoffeeScript file here, uh, just any JavaScript which is related to the project pages. Now, even though it says in here that this code should be related to the matching controller, it's really not enforced. This JavaScript and the same with the CSS will all be loaded on every single page because it's all bundled into one single file. Let me show you how that works. So I started up the server, and as you can see, it's working here, beta 1, and I can go to the projects uh, page, and this is what the page looks like. We currently don't have any projects, but if we check out the source code here, and you can see it's including two files in here. Under the assets directory, we have a CSS and JavaScript file. And so these are basically the bundled up versions of all the JavaScript and CSS code you have in your application. So I can show you the JavaScript file here. Just paste that in and notice right at the top here, it's already bundling in jQuery. And further down, it'll include that UJS file. And then it'll include all the other JavaScript we might have in our application. And if you take a look at the application.js file, you can see this is what it means by a manifest file. These commented out lines here, well, they're actually important because they're instructing it what files to load and when. So if we take out the jQuery files here, for example, and then if we reload our application.js file in the browser, you can see it removed jQuery completely from our application. So it's important that you keep these commented lines in the application because it's instructing it what to load. Now behind the scenes, what Rails uses to accomplish this is called sprockets. This is basically what's taking all the JavaScript files in your application and merging them all into a single one that's delivered to the client. So this means you can organize them really nicely however you want on the server side and development, and then uh, on the client side, it's just delivered in one single nice file. And now even though there's a lot of code inside of here, it'll all be minified in production automatically so you don't have to worry about that. Now in development mode, the application JS and CSS files are reloaded automatically. So if you make a change here, for example, in this CoffeeScript file, we can just add an alert call. And it's not necessary to use parentheses because we're in CoffeeScript here, but uh, I'll go into more detail in CoffeeScript in a future episode. And reload our projects page here, and we can see that alert message right here. Now in production, this is all cached for you. So you don't have to worry about the delay in performance for waiting for it to compile every time. All right, let's take a look at some of the other new features in 3.1. One is the database migrations. If you take a look at the uh, migration file that was generated with the scaffolding, you can see that it has one method in here called change, and this will handle both the up and down migrations. So you don't have to write both sets every time now, as long as it can determine it based on this change migration. So this is a really welcome addition in Active Record, and I can't wait to start using it more. And another nice feature in Active Record is identity maps. So if you take a look at your config uh, application.rb file and you scroll down, you can see there's a section on here on identity maps and you can see it's enabled by default. Uh, but for some reason, uh, it wasn't really enabled for me. So I actually needed to do a quick little hack to get it enabled and that is to add this line of code into my application. Now I'm sure this won't be necessary once 3.1 is released, but uh, in the beta, I found it necessary to enable identity mapping. So what does this identity map feature really give us? Well, let me show you how it works in the console here. So let's say I create a new project, give it a name called Yardwork. And well, one thing nice about 3.1 is that it shows you the log directly in the console here. That means I can see the SQL queries that's performed uh, in line, which is really nice. And uh, let's fetch that project again, say project.find using that given ID. And notice it says project loaded from the identity map. So it's not actually performing any SQL queries here to fetch the project from the database. It notices that the project instance is already loaded in memory here in Ruby, and it's actually going to use that exact same instance. So you can see if we check out the object ID for the project, it's actually going to equal the object ID of the second project that we loaded from the database. So that's because it's actually using the exact same object in memory in Ruby. This means you won't have any problems where you're setting attributes on one record and you think it's the same record that you're loading through an association or something. And it's actually going to be all the same instance in Ruby now. There are a number of other really nice additions in Active Record as well, such as nested has many through associations. 
So for example, let's say I have um, project has many tasks association here. And I also want to have many assignments through tasks. That's pretty normal. And let's say I want another has many association through assignments. So maybe have many users through assignments. Now in earlier versions of Rails, this wasn't possible, but in 3.1, you can now um, nest associations like this has many through with deep nesting. Uh, really amazing, and finally, I'm glad it's in here. Another nice little addition is the ability to assign roles to the attribute accessible call. So for example, let's say I have attribute accessible on here, and let's say I can set the name attribute, but you can now specify an as option onto here and say um, only the admin for example, is able to set that attribute. So now if I try to edit the name of this project here, change the name of it to something, update project, and you can see it didn't actually change the name because I'm not an admin role. So this means you can pass in the role through the controller when you're creating or updating a record. So if we go to our update action down here, you can see we update attributes. We can now pass in the as option and we can say as admin and now if I try to edit the project here, it now changes the name because I now have the admin role. So that's really nice because now we have a way to customize attribute accessible based on roles. I want to finish up by showing you a few additional niceties in the view layer. Uh, here we are in the form partial, which was generated by the scaffolding. And let's say I change this uh, text field here to a file field. Now normal, normally if you want to do file uploads, you would also need to pass in a uh, multi-part form option in the form. So now when you go to edit a project and view our form here and view the source, you can see our form is automatically marked as a multi-part form when we added that file field. So it's kind of nice not to have to add the multi-part option here in the form for call. Now let me show you one more nice thing here on the view layer and that has to do with links. So here we are on the show template for this project, and I have a path, uh, a link here for editing a project, and you can now pass in domain and subdomain options to URL helpers. So I can change this to edit project URL, and let's say I wanna change this subdomain. You can now just pass in a simple subdomain option, um, anything you want inside of here. So now when we go to the project show page and click on the edit link, you can now see it tries to go to the foo subdomain of that page. And finally, I just want to show you the test output here if we run rake test, uh, because the output is a little cleaner and prettier because it's using the turn gem that I showed you inside the gem file. You can see here it lists each of the tests and whether they pass or not nicely here. Now there's so many more things that I haven't covered here that are new in 3.1. There's automated streaming. Uh, there's view inheritance, and there's mountable engines, and so much more. Uh, and I'll be covering each of those in detail in future episodes, so stay tuned. Now, if you want a comprehensive list of all the changes in 3.1, I encourage you to check out this gist I made. It's basically, um, I gathered up all the changelog entries and pretty them up and put them all into this gist. So I encourage you to check it out, and I'll post a link in the show notes. Well, that's it for this overview on Rails 3.1. I hope you enjoyed it and expect more to come on more details and the new features.